But if you had all the collected money you needed, what kind of a ministry would you do? Feed the homeless or shelter the homeless or feed the hungry, all right? Catch them, what do you do? Okay. All right. So look for, for ways to reach kids that aren't able to come to church. That's cool. All right. So for the rest of you guys that are thinking, I hope some of these ideas have, have spurred your imaginations and your thoughts. Now I want you to take that a step further. And in some ways, some of you have already answered this, but why would you do that specific thing that came to mind? Cash, and why would you uh, take care of the homeless? Okay, so you you want to take care of them to make sure they've got a, a roof over their head and food to eat, right? Okay. Judah, why would you uh, work at finding creative ways to reach young people that can't come to church? Okay. All right. So you're you're interested in what we would call evangelism and discipleship, right? Reaching new people in new places and bringing them into relationship with Jesus. That's good. All right. So friends, the reason I ask you that question and then I the reason I ask you the why is because oftentimes you'll find that in your heart of hearts if that's truly the thing that you would do that generally God has already gifted you in some capacity with the ability to go out and to do that thing. Right? And so friends, as we think about stewardship today, one of the things that I want us to consider is like, what would it look like if we actually went out today and began to build those very things that we say we wanted? And what if we put our resources to do those things? How might our families, our churches, our communities change if we were to do that? So friends, as I said, we are on week four of our series on stewardship, and i got to turn my clicker on here. Even though I have week three, we are on week four. Um, so I want to go and just do a really uh, quick recap of our series in case you're just joining us for the first time today. So in week one, we, we looked at this concept of giving our first fruits, the idea that God is the, the benefactor, the one that gives us all that we have in our life and in, re, in proper faithful response, we're called to give of our first fruits, the very best of what we have, okay? And then in week two, we took time, well, literally took time and talked about how we can be stewards of our time, how we can structure our schedules in our day, how we can um, be a presence um, to people in our lives. And then last week, we looked at the, the idea of, of stewarding people, not in the sense that we use people as resources and pawns and move them around, but what it means to invest in people, um, to, to use our talents, gifts, and resources to influence their lives. Now today, friends, we are going to go on and we are going to talk about that wonderful concept of, of money and stuff, which everybody gets really excited about in church most of the time. And we're going to use a really familiar scripture, and when it comes to stewardship, it's probably the number one passage that people use for um, stewardship. But 
I think nonetheless it is still good for us to revisit this parable. It is the parable of the talents or the parable of the bags of gold from Matthew 25. So friends, I invite you to um, open your hearts and minds as I read this scripture to you this morning. So again, it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted wealth to them. To one he gave five bags of gold, to another two bags, and to another one bag, each according to his ability. Then he went on his journey. The man who had received five bags went at once and put his money to work and, gave five, and gained five bags more. So also the one with two bags of gold gained two more. But the man who had received one bag went off, dug a hole in the ground, and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those servants returned and settled accounts with them. The man who had received five bags of gold brought the other five. Master, he said, you entrusted me with five bags of gold. See, I have gained five more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness." The man with two bags of gold also came. Master, he said, you entrusted me with two bags of gold. See, I have gained two more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things, and I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. The man who received one bag of gold came. Master, he said, I knew that you are a hard man, harvesting where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. So I was afraid, and I went out, and I hid your gold in the ground. See, here is what belongs to you. His master replied, You wicked and lazy servant, so you knew that I harvest where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed. Well, then you should have put my money on deposit with the bankers so that when I returned, I would have received it back with interest. So take the bag of gold from him and give it to the one who has 10 bags. For whoever has been given more, then they will have an abundance. And whoever does not have, even that that they have will be taken away from them. And throw that worthless servant outside into the darkness where there will be a weeping and a gnashing of teeth. So friends, as we look at and find ways to explore um, this passage this morning, one of the questions that I want us to consider um, is whose kingdom are you building? Okay, and the reason I ask that question is because um, we now live in a culture that um, prioritizes the building of a self-kingdom over that of building God's kingdom. Right? We, we see our culture move in more and more hedonistic ways and tendencies as time goes on. Okay? And so the question for each of us to wrestle with is, when it comes to the things we've been given, all of the, the money we have, the success we have, the resources we have, how are we utilizing and stewarding those? Are we spending them, investing them in us, or are we spending and investing them into God's kingdom? Okay? So as we begin then this morning, let's look at the first few verses. Okay? Now, before we jump into the, to the verses themselves, I want to provide a little bit of context, because in order to understand this parable, we need to go back to chapter 24 in Matthew. And Jesus here is preparing his disciples for his departure. And he says, look, guys, I'm only going to be here for just a little bit of time, and then I'm going to go away. And while I'm gone, you're going to see a whole bunch of stuff, and it's not going to be good stuff. And during this time, some people are going to begin to doubt. Some people are going to not believe in me. There's going to be false prophets, and they'll lead people away. But I want you to endure during this time. I want you to, to stand steadfast and believe in me so that when I return, you'll be with me me okay and if you understand that context you can much better understand how this parable fits in to Jesus' teaching all right so now as we go in um, 
you know, I've entitled this sort of triple A because there's, there's three things to look at in these first couple of things. And the first one um, deals with the concept or the idea that this parable um, doesn't necessarily represent historical or, or reality, right? It's a story. It's an allegory told to prove or to make a point, all right? And Jesus tells the story and says, do you get the idea? Do you get the point of the story? Okay. Now again, allegorically, I think we can. It's safe to say that we can say that the master in this parable is Jesus, and that his servants are the disciples. Okay. And so I think also allegorically, we can say that the master is Jesus, and we are his disciples, so that we can um, understand this for our own lives. So as he begins in verse 14, he says again, and, and again, this goes back to the idea that Jesus is teaching what it's like to live into the, kingdoms of the kingdom of the heavens, all right? This is the way life works and operates in the kingdom of the heavens, okay? And so we have this master then who is preparing to go on a journey, and he brings his servants forward, and he entrusts them with, their wealth, with his wealth, Okay. Again, in week one, we talked about the fact that God is this generous, abundant provider. Okay, and that all of the things that we have in our life are a result of Him giving that. So whether you want to look at it as grace, as love, as physical, material resources, all of that come from God, and they come in abundance. And how do we know they come in abundance? Because look at the words, and again, this used to be titled the parable of the talents, right? The NIV changed it to be bags of gold. But a talent in biblical times represented, at least according to, to some of the scholars that I looked up, a talent was the equivalent of 20 years wages for a common laborer. And so when Jesus distributes five talents to a person, he's given them a whole lot of money, right? He's not just giving them a couple of coins. He's saying, look, I'm lavishing you with resources. Look at the abundance that I'm, I have given to you, right? And so even to the guy here that only receives one talent, one bag of gold, he's giving him 20 years of wages, right? If we see how good my math is on the spot. Right? So if somebody makes $20,000, which at least at one point used to be kind of a common wage for just a manual laborer, right? so to give them a talent would be what, $400,000? Is that right? Okay. So all at one time, Jesus says here, look at the abundance I give you, and whether you've got one bag or five bags, I've just given you a whole bunch of resources for your disposal. And I'm entrusting you that you will go out and use these in the ways that I want you to. Because again, friends, the reason, the reason Jesus creates the, the hierarchy of master and servant is because, again, the servant is not to just go out and spend the resources on himself, him or herself. The job of the servant is to take care of the estate of the master. In fact, if you go back and you look at the word stewardship throughout history, the word steward actually was a job description earlier in history. So the servant's job then is to look out for the best interest and to grow the master's estate, to grow the master's resources. All right? And we see this time and time again in even in in the biblical literature right think about joseph right the the guy with the coat of many colors think about how he gets taken to egypt and he's a slave and he's a servant but yet he grows in stature because he grows the estate of the jailer potiphar and then eventually the pharaoh right and so he's entrusted with this responsibility and because of his obedience and faithfulness to his servant he's continually elevate it. Now, the other part of this that I want to talk about is, again, this idea of authority. Because, friends, since the beginning of Genesis, from the very time that God creates Adam and Eve, he gives humanity authority to use the resources to help provide and to build the kingdom that he has in store. Right? And so what does he tell Adam and Eve? Look, I'm giving you the whole garden and you have authority and dominion over the creation. You can go out and name the animals. You can go and, and work within and cultivate the garden. All right? 
Think about the time when, when Moses leads the people out of Egypt, right? They didn't just hurry up and run out of Egypt with just a little tiny sack with a bag of clothes, right? No, they, they basically plundered Egypt, at least the story tells us that, and they carry all of these possessions out of Egypt so that they can go forward then and build a new kingdom, to be God's people in this new land, to be a symbol of his power and love and might in this new land, the promised land that they're going to go to. So friends, think about that in terms of us as servants, that on the one hand, we've been entrusted with Jesus' resources, right? And there's a level of responsibility that goes with it. But two, we're also not powerless in the use of those resources. We've been given authority to go out and to do certain things, to take care of the homeless, to feed the hungry, to help people with addictions, to care for our children and youth, to go out and reach new people in new places, all right? Now, again, that doesn't mean that all of us have the same amount of resources or the same ability, right? Because, again, the story is very clear that each one is given a different amount, but they're given a different amount based on the ability that they have, okay? And that's important because, again, even though Cashton is not an adult, he still has the capability of doing some work for the homeless and taking care of the hungry, at his age, right? The same way some, the rest of us can do things according to the ability, the gifts, and the talents that we have been given. Now, again, most of you are pretty astute, and, the, and some of this idea of giving different resources really bothers us, right? Human beings have almost an innate ability to de detect differences, right? Kids are a prime example of this, right? How many times, how many of you parents, grandparents have ever heard the phrase, that's not fair, right? Almost instantly, right? Or what do you do when your, your child or grandchild comes home and says, well, that's not fair. My friend has this and why don't I have this? Or how come my friend gets to do this? Or my brother gets to do this and I don't get to do this, right? And it leads into this idea of comparison, okay? And so friends, when we move into this, it takes our focus off of where it should be and places it on something that's unhealthy, right? Now, I will say that human beings, at least as we age, we tend to realize that comparison doesn't always benefit us, right? When we're kids, it really bothers us when there are differences. When we get a little bit older, we just kind of say, yeah, it doesn't matter what the Joneses are doing. I don't need to keep up with them. I'm just going to live my life. All right, But it can, if we're not careful, lead to envy, right? That we worry more about what other people have and a desire in a very unhealthy way to have what they have. It can also lead us to compromise some of our beliefs because we say, you know what, I want this so bad that I don't really care how I, how I go about and how I'm going to get it, Right? And again, friends, think of the rise in crime we have, the, the rate of which, you know, even shoplifting has increased, right? There are businesses going out of business because the level of, of shoplifting going on in some, in some areas is so high they simply can't even operate their stores, okay? So again, there can be compromise in the way that we do things. The other part, on the other hand, then, is that sometimes it can lead us to arrogance, Right? Because we can say, oh, look at how, how powerful I am. Look at all of this great stuff I have. Look at all of these great things I'm doing. And we can sort of lord it over people who don't seem to have as much. Right? And friends, that's one of my biggest struggles and challenges with the social media space right now. Right? This idea that social media feeds are just filled with all of these good things that happen in people's lives. Right? All the trips, all the success, all these perfect pictures right? And yet very seldom do you see someone, and again, because it's not a, a safe space most of the time, to share the struggle, right? We don't get to see the journey of how that person got from here to there, at least not very often. And so friends, we have to be careful then that even in the social media world, and I speak specifically to our young kids, that we don't get caught up in what we see on certain things, but we remember again who God made us to be. Now, 
as we go into the next couple of verses, there's this idea then, and I've entitled this, how we use the resources we're given matters, okay? And so the two guys that are given the most resources, they go out immediately and they put the master's money to work, okay? And so on the one sense, there's this, this idea, this theme of urgency, Okay, like they didn't hesitate. They didn't wait for six months after he, after the master was gone and says, no, they literally took the resources they've been given and they went out right away and they began to invest them. They began to distribute them in a way that was going to care for and grow the master's estate. Okay, now again, we've already talked about this level of responsibility, the purpose that the servant has. Okay, and so friends, again, I find more and more that as we go on, and especially in in some younger generations, the idea of purpose is really lacking. Kids and youth constantly struggle to understand what their purpose is in life, right? Even young adults now are, are struggling with that. You get people 30, 40 years old that are confused about what their purpose is, what their meaning of life. Why are they even here? But friends, again, when we understand that we are God's creation and we're here to build his kingdom, that gives us a purpose. When we look at the gifts and talents that we have, we can all of a sudden go, okay, maybe God has made me and equipped me so that I can do this, right? Whatever that is for you whether you're going to take care of the the hungry and the homeless, whether you're going to build a business that allows your community to grow and to thrive, whether you're going to be at home taking care of your family. All right, When you step into that, you understand that you have a purpose, that your life is meaningful. But with that purpose then comes responsibility. Right, You have the responsibility to do that job and to do it to the very best of your capability. All right? And so, friends, as we talk about stewardship of our, of our money and of our material possessions, think about that again in terms of investing. What does it mean to distribute and to invest those resources in the things that God has equipped us to do? Okay? Now, again, two of them go and are faithful in, in operating and taking the responsibility that the master requires. The other one goes out and just digs a hole and throws his money in the ground and says, you know what, I, you know, we don't know why he does it. He just says, well, I don't, maybe I'm too scared to lose it. Maybe it's just safe if I just put it in the ground and save it for a rainy day. All right? But friends, again, we're not called to sit on our hands. Okay? We're called to use these resources in a way that matters. So I want to take a moment and I want us to consider, again, two pieces of stewardship when it comes to money and material possessions. The first one I've entitled generosity, and generosity in in the context that I'm going to use it is a more spontaneous distribution of your resources. Okay, so when you're walking by and you see that guy standing on the street corner with a sign saying, look, I need some help, and the Spirit puts it on your heart to say, you know what, give that guy 20 bucks. You don't go home and think about it. You don't go home and consult all of your bank accounts and say, well, okay, you know, generosity is the spirit led you, moved you to give that $20 to that person. You just give it to them, right? Or there's something that comes up within the church. There's a ministry all of a sudden. There's a, a Operation Christmas Child box down there, and you say, you know what? I'm not going to worry about whether that really fits into my into my time, into my schedule. It's just something that the spirits lay in my heart. I'm just going to grab a box, fill it up, and bring it back. All right. On the other hand, then there are a more structured path, right? This should be what I call our investing plan. And so, what does it look like for you to actually plan out and structure? how much your giving is and where your giving is going or how you're sharing the resources that you have with other people. So friends, take for a moment and think about all of the things you have. Think about all the money you have. Think about your house, your cars, all the stuff that you've got. Now if you're able to, just put a price on that. How much, how much resources are you sitting on? at this moment. Now, what percentage of that do you give? What percentage of that resource that you've been given goes back to build God's kingdom? 
Now again, friends, that's a pretty sobering thing sometimes because we're a people here in America that are, have been blessed with an abundance of stuff, right? There are people all over in the world that have a mere fraction of the abundance that we have in our lives. Now, again, I want to be and try to navigate this carefully because I, it feels like I'm going to heap shame or guilt on you saying, you know what, you're not giving enough, but that's really between you and God to decide. But it is a sobering fact to think, you know, here's this amount that I'm setting on, but maybe I'm only given 1% or 2%, right? And friends, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say, and I'm going to use some examples for my life, and again, it's not for me to, to show how great I am or anything, but this is my line of thinking. This is the way that I structure stuff, and I want you to use it just simply as an example for you to follow, okay? So when we talked about this idea of giving, or if I were, let me start over. So if I take that number, I would say that Sarah and I probably give around 15% of our income to the church or to other things. We invest about 15% of our income. Now again, friends, I can say that I'm beginning to wrestle and think that maybe that number for us needs to be increased, because I look at the abundance we have in our lives, and again, I just think sometimes God says, Josh, look at the stuff you have. Are you utilizing these things for my purpose, or are you just sitting on them so you're comfortable? Again, friends, I'm very clear that this is between you and God. You have to wrestle with what that looks like, all right? But I want to provide some structure for you in this. And so as we talk then about investing one of the things that I say, and I don't just say this biasly as a pastor, but this is something that Sarah and I have done in our giving since the time that we were together, and I believe that, again, according to the scriptures, 10%, at least 10% of your resources should be dedicated back to the church or back to your place of worship. That should always be the first priority when it comes to your giving, to your structured investing. Okay? Now, for me, again, I put even more strictures on that because I, you know, I also don't designate it to anything specific in the church because for me, part of it is to give without trying to control that resource. So I just give to the church because that's what God calls me to do. Now, after that piece, I would say that there's a whole bunch more flexibility in how you want to create that investment structure. Because again, it's going to be those things and places that God lays on your heart. For me, my next level after I give to the church is to invest in people that are really hungry to go do ministry and mission. Right? I love to invest in people that say, oh, you know what, I, want to, I really have a heart to go work with these kids. And so Sarah and I have invested in people who serve on crew and go and, and do ministry to people on college campuses. When Jenna came to us and said, you know, Josh, I really just have a heart to go on mission and to share the gospel with people that have never heard it before, and I'm going to go to, to Asia, I'm going to go to the Middle East, will you support me and partner with me? Yes, I will, because that matches my second priority. After that, I moved down to, you know, helping those people in need. And so our family sponsors a little guy named Victor who lives in um, Uganda, right? And we look to help and support his family because we understand that we've been blessed here. And if we can help them to rise out and, and to have new opportunities and to hear about Jesus, we want to do that, all right? And then I distribute out based on the other needs that arise, all right? Now, again, I'm running short on time here, so I really got to hurry up, but there's one other area when it comes, especially to money and resources, that I think are very important, and they're often overlooked in the church, and that is what I call legacy or estate giving. And so, friends, do you have something in your will that after you pass away, a certain percentage of those resources will go back to continue to do the ministry that you want to have done, okay? And friends, again, we know both here and in New Auburn that our churches have been blessed because if people have left this world, they have left us gifts and resources that have allowed us continue to do very important ministry in mission. And so friends, that should be another component of your giving. But again, friends, even going back to this idea of material stuff, 
right? Money is always an easy thing to talk about. But think about all the material possessions you have. How many of you use your house for ministry, right? Just invite people over, have a cup of coffee with them, show hospitality to them. Have a prayer group or a Bible study around your table, right? What about your cars? Are you able to pick somebody up that can't drive, bring them to church, take them to the grocery store, right? Think about all the other stuff we have. And I don't know if you're like me, you guys tend to be collectors, right? Like we just, we, we have to keep buying bigger houses because our other houses just keep getting filled up with more and more stuff, right? Like when we moved from Jim Falls, I was just appalled. I'm like, you know, we had a certain weight limit we had to get for the, the conference to pay for our stuff. Well, we moved a whole bunch of our stuff ourselves, and we we're still overweight. I felt like I just kept pulling boxes and crates and totes out of this house, and I'm thinking, I've only been here for eight years. Where did all of this stuff come from? You know, not to throw my wife under the bus, but I told her, I said, we're getting to the point where the parsonage feels like it's going to burst. And I told her, I said, if you go thrift sailing anymore and you bring something home, you have to take something from the house and go set it out on the curb because we can't take any more stuff in the house. All right. But think of all that stuff that we don't use, right? Could that be used to help people in need? Do we really need to keep all of that stuff? Or do we allow our stuff to become an idol in our lives? Right? And again, God's really been working on my heart on this because one of the things that, that I love, one of my guilty and pleasures in life is what? Books. Right? I love to buy books. Sometimes I think I buy them just to look at them, right? Because it's just like, oh, this is awesome. I can't wait to read it. But some of them I never get to. Others I've been gifted and they just sit there on my shelf. But you know what? That library I have makes me feel really comfortable. But what's the purpose of a library? To share it, right? For books to go out and come back. For books to go out and to come back. Not just for me to sit there and look at it and feel good because I have all of these ideas and things around my life. And so God's been really working on my heart. Now I have to throw Michelle under the bus for a minute because she, uh, she sent me a meme this week and says, oh, what happens to people that are asked to get rid of all the books that they don't read? And it shows this poor lady having a heart attack. And I thought, oh, yeah, that's probably would be me if somebody told me I had to get rid of all the books that I don't read, right? But friends, as we look back to what Jesus says in Luke 12, he says, for where your treasure is, there your heart is also. Okay? And so friends, if our focus is on all of the stuff, on all of the money, of all of the success, then we've missed something very important. And our heart is not in the right place. Now friends, there are rewards for obedience and faithfulness. Okay? And the scriptures say that after a long time, the master comes back, right? This idea that Jesus will once again return, and when he does, big things are going to happen. And at that time, Jesus is also going to take an accounting of how we utilize the resources that we have been given. And so for the two guys that take their talents and they go out and invest them wisely, they, they return a hundredfold, right? They each bring back double what they were given, or at least the same amount that they were given, right? And the master praises them. He says, you know what? You took five bags, you took two bags, and you created five more, two more. Well done, good and faithful servant. And because you've been obedient and, and utilized these little things, or you were faithful in this little bit, guess what? I'm going to bless you with even more. I'm going to give you even more resources to go out and to use, now come and, and spend time with me and enjoy my presence. Enjoy life here in the kingdom. Now the other guy is not so fortunate because again, he didn't go out and invest or grow the master's resources. Rather, he just stuck them in the ground and said, you know what, I'm just going to put them there because, you know, I... I'm scared of who this guy is. I don't really know that my master is really a good guy. I don't know if I can trust his heart. I don't know if the master will, will take care of me, right? And that's what the guy says. He makes the excuse that says, you know what, master? I know that you're a hard man. And I know that you go out and you sow here and you gather here. And I was just afraid that um, 
you know, I wanted to just return um, what you gave me. But I didn't use it. I just stuck it in the ground for a rainy day. Now, friends, there's a couple of interpretations that I think are, are interesting here. And the first one, again, is this excuse that the master doesn't need us, right? That the master, because he's so wealthy, he's so generous, that he doesn't need us to do stuff, right? Again, friends, no, God has given us authority since the beginning of humanity to now to go out and to grow his kingdom, all right? The other one, and this is a big deal, especially for Christians, is they say, you know what? My stuff doesn't matter. I'm not able to be this great big person, right? I can't, I don't have lots of money. I don't have a whole bunch of resources. The little bit that I'm, I'm able to give just doesn't matter. Friends, I, that couldn't be further from the truth because again, where is our focus? Our focus is on Jesus who is a good and loving God, right? And if we're focused on growing the kingdom, if we're investing in the kingdom, that one dollar is just as important as that thousand dollars, right? The talents that you have, whether you're cash in or whether you're the oldest person in here, and I won't name anyone just for the sake of that, but if you're cash in the youngest one or the oldest one here, the abilities and talents you have matter as long as you use them to grow God's kingdom, right? And I believe that if you do that, you're going to see a return on those things. So don't ever accept the lie that you don't have enough value or that your contribution doesn't mean anything because that couldn't be further from the truth that's a lie straight from hell itself now the other thing that i think is interesting and we can talk about quickly here is the idea of scarcity and risk averseness okay and scarcity friends is simply fear Right? It's our fear that we don't have enough resources and that if we give generously, our resources are going to run out. All right. Again, I think that that is a lie. And I think that the more you step into that faith in God, the more you find that you're being a responsible steward of the resources you have been giving and investing them the way Jesus wants you to invest, the more you're going to find that there's not scarcity, but indeed abundance. Remember, he didn't just give you a little bit to start out with. He gave you 20 years of wages to start out with or more. He said, here's a lot. Go do with it what you will. We have an abundant and generous God, and we need to step in and to believe that with our whole hearts. Additionally, God has made us each with different risk tolerances, right? You go to a financial advisor, and they're going to show you the different risk graphs, right? You can be in a conservative one, you can be in a mid-range one, and you can be in a super aggressive one, right? For those of you that are very much on the conservative end, that's fine, my prayer for you is that you step out and you grow that a little bit. That you're not afraid to take risks with God, God's resources to go out and do the things he calls you to do. For those of you that are on the other end, be careful because despite your high tolerance for risk, you're also, you're also called to be a good and faithful servant with that. You're called to take calculated risks, risks that are going to grow the kingdom, not just go and waste stuff because you think you have all of this stuff to spare. Now, friends, there are consequences. And again, to go back to 24, there are consequences for people that will not utilize the resources God has given them. There are consequences for those people that will fall away or be misled by different things, right? And so there will be an accounting on the day that Jesus returns and he says, look, how did you care? How were you a steward for the things that I, I gave to you? So friends, let me end then with a couple of action steps for you. The first one is to reflect on your current lifestyle and, and use of resources. Again, answer that question. Whose kingdom are you building? Yours or God's? And secondly, create a kingdom giving and investment plan. Think about and prioritize those things you want to, to give to. And then again, go out and start investing with those. You know what? You want to start, you want to have a boys and girls club here? Start. 
You want to have an addiction center here? Start. You want to go out and reach new kids in new places? Start and start today because God's already given you the resources, right? Maybe you don't have all the resources yet, but you have some resources with which to start that ministry. God bless you guys. Let us move to